Okay, how's everybody doing? Uh, welcome to this month's edition of the Chemical of the Month, put on by Hazmat IQ by Federal Resources. I'm Chris. I'm Kurt. A lot of people call it the Michigan Mafia around the office because apparently we hired everybody out of Michigan. Different story for a different day. However, today's call, what we're going to do today, we're going to talk about a call I think a lot of us are running on right now where we had a situation where law enforcement went out on a call. They went to bust a warrant and they found something there. They weren't sure what it is, so they dispatched Hazmat. Then when they were serving the warrant, they sent us over a thing, said, hey, we need Hazmat to come check this out. And they found a container that they say is leaking in the garage, and it contains a product called aniline. Now, off the top of my head, I don't know what aniline is. Didn't take that, didn't study it, didn't do whatever. But I'm gonna utilize my Hazmat IQ system to be able to size that up and give myself a good prediction of behavior so that when we get there on the scene, we can immediately go right to work. So Kurt, I'm gonna grab my charts. Why don't you grab a NIOSH? All right, so my charts I have, I have version 20, which are the new Hazmat IQ charts. If, uh, if you'd like to have more information on that, give us a ring at info at hazmatiq.com. We'll send you all the information about it. But I've got version 20 of the charts. Now, remember, chart one, chart two, the way I always think of it, if the fire chief's walking around, I use chart one just to keep them away from me. But the reality of it is the most functional chart is chart two. I'm going to look on here, and I'm looking for aniline or anything there about Kurt, do you see anything on here for aniline? I don't see anything over there in aniline. Right, so here's what we're doing. The answer is no. My initial size up, we're above the line. So my 10 second size up here is above the line. What's that tell me? This is a gas. My hot zone's 300 feet. It's going to have a vapor pressure. It's going to be producing vapors. The vapors themselves are going to be heavier than air because think about it. Which one's more dangerous? Down low where we live or up high where the pigeons live? I'll go with the one down low, right? So we're gonna predict that this is a heavier than air. It's toxic, everything's toxic, but how is this toxic? This is toxic in parts per million, which in my head is telling me this is a vapor, gas, heavier than air, toxic. It's gonna have an IP, if it has an IP, I should be able to see it with my PID. It's gonna have carbon and hydrogen in it. It's gonna be able to see with my FID, right? Is it flammable? The answer is always yes on size up when I'm above the line. Yes, it's gonna have an LEL and a UEL. Yes, it's gonna have a flash point. Yes, it's corrosive. I'm gonna predict that it's an acid. I'm gonna predict that it contains fluorine. That, so I'm gonna take my pH and my F paper with me. It's reactive, everything is reactive. How is this reactive on prediction? Yes, it'll polymerize. Yes, it'll be air reactive. Yes, it'll be water reactive. And the last one is yes on prediction, this is gonna be radioactive. That's my size up. The other side of this is, what do I wear on size up? What am I turning around and telling the back step guys they gotta wear? Hey, turnout's an SCBA and at least our stay alive five meters, right? Our safe kit. I'm gonna have a rad F and PH paper. I'm gonna have my temp gun and I'm gonna have my four gas meter. A lot of people will ask, Chris, how do you guys wear that? It comes up all the time in class. Real quick, so on the dummy here, well, we call it Kurt, but on our, on our model Kurt here, what we look at is I've got my F and PH paper on my mask. I'm wearing my PRD over here. I've got my four gas meter here and I've got my temp gun or my reaction meter right here. So guess what you'll notice? My hands are completely free to do work and I have all the meters that measure the hazards that can kill me today, hence the safe kit, the stay alive five meters. So Kurt, I've sized this up. I've got us that base prediction. I know we're wearing turnouts in SCBA. However, let's go to chart three and see if we can get this more dialed in. So I go to chart three, first place I start up in the flammable chart clue box, and I'm looking for any part of the name up there. And all we know at this point is aniline. And I look, and I don't see anything in there. Hmm. So the answer is no. So I go over to the first name corrosive gas clues box. And remember, the whole name's got to be there. It's got to be exactly correct. Spelling counts. And I'm looking for aniline. The cool part of it is they're in alphabetical order. There's only one A. Guess what? It's not there. My play is red one, which didn't change my size up at all from that initial size up I did back on chart two. So Kurt, that's our size up. Red one, if I come down here to the red one box, unknown, no match, not sure. Now we know what the name is. We just can't match it up anywhere else in the system. All hazards are present. If I read across, I'm gonna see it's got rad, it's got my F paper, my acid, and my base papers are all potentially gonna change. So everything you just said in the SOG. And nothing changed, right. that's it. That's the short way of getting to the right answer, which is everything's in play, now it's asking me mission-driven PPE. Now, I might be able to call the law enforcement on the way, hey, is there a rescue, pull everybody back. But the bottom line is at this point, I don't know. I tend to respond out and turn out an SCBA because the things I run on more probably are gonna be flammable than non-flammable. We live in an organic world. So for my crew, they're gonna be dressed just like that. Turnouts SCBA and our meters. As I walk across though, 
look, what's this step two reference, Kurt? So step two reference, you know, refers to what we like to teach in the class and we look at our NIOSH for that. But keep in mind, again, it's SDS papers, shipping papers, any other reference material you have on that, uh, that chemical, and you can look up some of the physical and chemical properties that we want to look at from that SOG. So as we look down at some of those things we want to look for, for example, is the properties. So, right, so what, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do, it, it, this isn't a bad system, is I know what I predicted, and I'm going to read these right off to Kurt, and he's going to tell me either, yes, we're good to go, or we need to adjust. So I've got my book. I'm going to use the NIOSH right here on my phone. It's a free app, great resource for you guys as responders out there, and a lot of good information. Yeah, so. Kurt, that's actually a good point. When we talk about reference, guys, it doesn't just have to be the NIOSH. If you have, a, if you have other tools, technologies, or reference resources that are out there, and they work for you, by all means, use them. The system fits, right? It Absolutely. fits with all of these references. Right, so we predicted on size up, we said gas in our initial hot zone was 300 feet. What, what is this? Basically, physical description under here, it's showing us that it is a colorless brown or oily liquid with all an right. aromatic amine-like odor. No worries, here's the cool part. We call it size up and we tweak down. So Kurt just told me it's a liquid. My call just got 50% better because I'm gonna go from a 300 foot hot zone to a 150 foot hot zone. It said that it had a vapor pressure. Yeah, the vapor pressure on this one, Chris, as I look it up, it is 0.6 millimeters of mercury. 0.6, that seems like a really low number, Kurt. Yeah, concrete's about zero, uh, puts off really almost no vapor. So this one's pretty low, but keep in mind it's an oily substance. A lot of oily liquids don't tend to produce a lot of vapors. So I think of it this way, when I see a vapor pressure of 0.6, I know this, I'm gonna have to be right up on top of that thing to get any meter readings that are looking for vapors in air. That's correct. Yeah, so I have to be real close. All right, so we said, uh, we said these vapors, though, that they were going to be heavier than air. Are they? Yeah, they're absolutely heavier than air. So remember, molecular weight, right? That's what we use. 29 is air. This stuff's 93, so three, four times heavier than air. All right, we said it was toxic. Is it toxic? Everything's toxic. Chris, you know that. Even water's toxic. IDLH on this stuff is toxicity 100 parts per million. So if you look at 100 parts per million, uh, we refer that to hydrogen cyanide at being 50. That's our reference gas that we like to use because that was used in the death chamber. But the cool way it's to think of it is PPM is vapors and air, right? Yeah, it's vapors and air. Yep. Right and on. it's a little less toxic. But the other thing this says, Chris, it's kind of interesting, it says CA. Right, CA means can, uh, carcinogenic or cancer causing. Uh, so this stuff can cause cancer and that's one of the concerns with it as well. So in theory, really what I'd like to do is try to get none of this stuff in me. Oh, absolutely, yeah, no, you wanna stay away from this stuff uh, you know, because of that long-term. Right now, immediate might not have an immediate effect on me, but again, that long-term cancer causer, who knows? Well, that's a cool part. So how many parts per million of it is inside my, SB, my SCBA? Inside your SCBA, nothing. Right on. Last time I checked, they don't charge us for air, so the moral of the story is wear what? SCBA. Right on. Anytime you see something in that IDLH box, you should be wearing your SCBA. Okay, so we predicted that we would be able to see this with the PID. What's the IP of this product? So the IP on this stuff, 7.70 uh, EV. So if you remember your PID is 10.6 or less, it'll be able to see it. Now that's again, producing vapor, so. So my uh, PID though, because the, remember the vapor pressure was really small in this one, that PID is gonna have to be yeah, where? A little closer. That'd be little pretty closer. close, right? Yeah. I'd be a little concerned if I got there and I'm getting readings on this stuff from 20 feet away. Oh, absolutely, you, yeah. You think yeah. It's, I think there could be something else present. Yeah, I would think either something else present or something's there heating that stuff yeah. and making yeah, more good. vapors absolutely. for some reason. So yeah, that's I why we take all our meters. Take your temp gun. I think another it. key in here, folks, is we don't lock in on just what our size up is. We size up and we're making a prediction, but realize there can always be something else present. Right, not all dispatch info, no matter whether it comes from uh, a citizen, 911, or even a law enforcement uh, on scene, right? We gotta go off the information we have, but just realize there could be something else there. Absolutely. So we said this was flammable also, and you said it was a liquid, so what's the LEL of this? So the LEL in this, that's 1.3. If you look at the UEL, it's about 11%. All right, so all I'm really kind of looking for right here is, yes, it had a UEL, mm -hmm. but what's the second question I have to ask? Because this is a liquid, what tells me if it's flammable today. Flashpoint's 158 degrees, Flashpoint's going to tell us whether it's flammable or not. Now you know ambient temperature on the surface could be, or the surface could be actually one and a half times ambient temperature typically, so I would certainly want to use my temp gun where you said that container was leaking out onto the ground because it may be 70 ambient, but I want to get that temperature on the ground. Yeah, to make sure we're not anywhere near we're that Flashpoint. We're from Michigan and it's February out. <laughs> I'm just gonna take a wild stab in the yeah. dark. Yeah. Probably not 158. Probably not there here. Could yep, be, exactly. probably not. <laughs> right. So we have a tool, our temp gun, right? So when we get there, one of the things that we're gonna verify is, what's the temperature of the spill? Because the temperature right. of the spill 
as compared to the flash point is going to tell me whether that's flammable today. Now 158, I'm predicting this probably is not flammable, and I'm relaying that back to the guys in the back. Right. And I want to get two readings there. I want to get the temperature of the ground, but I also want to get the container. If there's any sort of chemical reaction, Absolutely. this is reacting with something else, it's going to show me by, you know, temperature steadily rising or fastly rising. Right. Is there anything in the book, uh, we predicted on the corrosivity, but is there anything in the book that tells you anything about corrosivity? Yeah, as far as a liquid, no, but they do have corrosivity gases that you can look up. So the DOT guide numbers, and I'm showing a guide number 153, so that's not corrosive. Well, and remember, the guide numbers are gases, right? 118, right. 123, 124, right. 125. So if it's a liquid and it's corrosive, how do I prevent myself from getting uh, exposed to that? Well, you stay, the, yeah. yeah, the no trip, stay the no trip technique. Yeah, yeah exactly. right? Don't fall into yeah, it. Don't get into this stuff, right? Right. Good, good job, Kurt. <laughs> right. Does it contain fluorine? Uh, looking in the chemical formula box, uh, it does not contain fluorine at all. Cool. So I don't have to take my F paper? You do take your F oh, paper okay, good. Good. and let it rule it out. Remember, right. your meters are king when it comes to this. We always trust the meters. Right on. So that's a good point Kurt brings there. We make a prediction, we size it up, and then there's meters downrange. The meters downrange are always the ultimate right answer. So that we predicted this was reactive. Does this polymerize, Kurt? Where are the three places I would look? So I'm looking at DOT guide number. I don't see a P after it. I'm looking also in a formula box. I don't see an equal sign. And then I look down there on that freaky box. Remember, incompatibilities, reactivities. Down there, I see strong oxidizers, acids, toluene, diastocyanate, and alkalis. I don't see anything that says this stuff polymerizes. All right, good. So we can tweak down on that size up. We're, we gonna still take our, we're still going to take our temp gun with us. Hey, is it radioactive? I don't show it as uh, 161 through 166 on the DOT guide number, so it's not radioactive. Okay, good. And how about from an explosive hazard? Could this be, you know, a DOT, you know, hazard class one explosive? Yeah, exactly. It's 153 on the DOT guide number, so it is not explosive again. All right, excellent. So we've now sized this up to a product that we probably have never been before, and here's what we know. We have a liquid that's toxic, that's producing some, some vapor, but not a lot. Uh, it's flammable, but not flammable today. It's not reacting, it's not radioactive, it's not gonna release a corrosive gas. So at the end of the day, when we, when we complete our size up and our tweak, basically what I'm gonna be telling the folks that are responding to us, hey, we're gonna put our turnouts on, we're gonna put our SCBA, we're gonna take our meters down range with us, and this is what we're gonna do. I wanna get down there to be able to try to start to figure out what is this liquid, right? They're telling me aniline, where is that coming from? How do I start to put the pieces and parts together? So when we get there, Kurt and I arrive on scene, we do a, we do a briefing with the law enforcement uh, incident commander over there, he gives us what we have, I'm going to go back and brief the team, tell them what we're going to do on our first entry, and at this point, I want to ensure there's no hazards, but I'm also trying to get my eyes on this to see what the product is. The other thing that came up when Kurt and I were talking to the, uh, to the law enforcement uh, incident commander is, we asked him what they were serving the warrant for, because we felt that was kind of important, and, and basically what he told us was, uh, the individual was part of a suspected fentanyl ring. So it's, it's an interesting one, aniline. Uh, so we're going to put our turnouts on, we're going to put our SCBAs on. Now here's the simple truth and reality of this. If we don't want to wear our turnout gear and SCBA, Kurt, could we wear level B or even a class two suit? If, you know, if I don't work for the fire department and I don't have all turnouts and that's all I have is general, you know, uh, Seaburn or uh, hazmat PPE? Yeah, you can wear a level B or you can wear a multi-threat suit. Obviously take all your meters with you. The one hazard you're going to be worried about here that uh, you, is going to stand out is that LEL because if you're wearing plastic, Chris, you don't want to go uh, yellow light is 1%, mm -hmm. red light's at 2%. So you don't want to go anywhere past that uh, wearing plastic. And when we talk plastic, we talk level Bs, we talk some of these multi-threat suits and those mm -hmm. things coming out. A lot of law enforcement wearing those. Um, and even fire departments are starting to go to some of those things as well so they don't ruin a $2,500 set of turnout gear uh, on a small spill like this. Yeah, right on the other side of it too is if we're not doing a rescue, do I have time? You do have time. Time's on your side, right? Slow down, right? Yeah. All right. So good to go. Absolutely. Uh, Chris, a couple things uh, I'd like to point out. Uh, one of the things you got on your charts that we look at, we always look at those red light meters, and then we start getting into some of those green light meters. So green lights are identifications, things like that. If we're looking at uh, identification of this, law enforcement a lot of times wants those field presumptive results. And uh, you, you may be able to use an instrument like this. Thermal makes the uh, Gemini. It's certainly in their library. Uh, this is good identification stuff to give law enforcement a good idea of where they've got to go and how they got to respond to this type of call. So you could be the difference between them sending it to a lab, getting results six to eight weeks later, or them sending it to a lab knowing that this is the real deal and uh, you know they got an issue here. So, so basically that'll detect unknown solids and liquids? Yeah, this'll, this is a green light meter, so this will actually take and identify solids and, and unknown liquids for you uh, in the library, and this is a, a real good 
piece of equipment for that. Yeah, and so. I think if I remember correctly, the key to that is it has to have a covalent bond for it to be able to see it. That's correct. Yeah, right on. All right. Well, that's a good piece of information Kurt just gave us right there because at the end of the day, you know, I have all my meters and all my meters are classifying hazards for me. And that's great. But now when I get into the point where I need to be able to identify, maybe law enforcement wants to know, is this or is this not? So when we come back, here's what's crazy. What came up on a screen on one of our reference pieces, not necessarily the Gemini, but maybe another tool that we had, what was the name of that chemical that popped up? Phenol Not aniline, but what? Yeah, phenylamine. So if you look under synonyms and trade, nam uh, trade names and all the references, phenylamine is another, another exact name for this. And we could certainly run that through the system real quick and, and, and see if that gets us any more information and narrow this thing down. Yeah, if I run phenylamine, it's not below the line, it's above the line. I make my initial above the line size up, but if I quickly get to chart three, when I look at the flammable char clue box, I see the phenol in there. So that tells me immediately this thing's organic. It's got carbon and hydrogen in it. Also means I'm gonna be able to see it with an FID. And when I come down and I look at the amines, now I'm running a red eight, all right? So I might put that out over there. And we can go through that whole size up, but the point of the system, folks, is whether you ran a red one on aniline or you were able to get that name, phenylamine, and then you ran it as a red eight, you're both gonna to get to the same result, you're both gonna be safe, you're both gonna be able to do your job in the most effective, safe, and the other one that we always leave out is the most confident matter you can as a responder. Because when you push this information up, you wanna be confident, you wanna know what's going on, and you wanna make sure that we're making the right decisions with the right information at the right time. Chris, couple things, look at red eight on there, corrosive turns blue, that's an above the line, usually they turn red on your pH paper, that one turns blue, so now I've got carbon and hydrogen in the formula, I also have a corrosive that turns blue. Uh, I got two sides of the fire triangle, potentially an oxidizer or, or uh, to look at. So I want to look at that and, and verify and ensure that uh, I take all my meters with this uh, because that could be the difference. You might have flammable vapors coming up. You dip your pH paper, it turns blue. Pretty good chance you're looking at this, uh, this product here. So yeah, we want to thank you guys for your attention this month on the, or for this month's chemical of the month. The reality of it is we gave you a scenario with aniline. Uh, all of you know there's a huge opioid crisis going on in this country right now, national emergency, precursor, fentanyl lab, all those things should be start cluing me off. If you or your team is experiencing this and you're not quite sure how to run those calls, get a hold of Federal Resources, info at federalresources.com. We've got a new program called Drug IQ. It runs you through everything. It's a, a very comprehensive class and you will leave that class with the confidence you need to be able to respond to any of these opioid crisis type calls. Have a good month. We'll see you next month. <laughs> Damn it, Kurt. Nobody told you to talk.